the Books with Brooks. I'm here, my friend Laura. Hello. Hi, Laura. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Are you ready to talk about death? Yeah, I have my Dr. Zevia <laughs> product placement. <laughs> How is it? You know, it's okay. Really? It's okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> as someone who doesn't like Dr. Pepper, I definitely don't like Dr. Dr. Zevia. Dr. sounds like it would, um, the topic of a crime podcast. Yes, it like does. Like, he definitely committed a crime. Oh, Dr. Zevia did it. Mm-hmm. He's guilty. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Well, we are gathered here today to discuss, what, what month is it? Oh, yes. It's January. Our January book, which is called The Immortalists, a novel by Chloe Benjamin. But this is our January book. The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. We had our book club last week, and it was an it was an excellent discussion. Yeah. A lot of great questions. Yes. Thought-provoking questions. Lots of thought-provoking questions. This book deals with like a ton of like major like I don't know, like moral and ethical quandaries. Yeah. And so and I think caused a lot of self-reflection at least for me and I think for a lot of other people. In the book club. Yeah, I think so too. There's like a lot of questions about like, yeah, like, like what do you do with your life? Mm -hmm. And do you make different choices if you know, like when your life is going to end? Mm -hmm. (gasps) I can't wait to talk more about psychics. We were just speaking before I hit record. And Laura, I know you have some interesting stuff to share. Um, But let's do a really quick plot rundown for people who maybe haven't read the book in a while or aren't that familiar with it. Let's do it. <laughs> do you want it to start it? I can start it. You start it. Okay. Well, the premise of the book is that the four gold, golds, gold, golds, gold children, just singular. Goldses. One gold. There are four of them, though. Four gold children. Varia, Daniel, um, Clara, Clara, and Simon. Simon. When they're kids, they're, like, ranging in age from, like, 8 to 13. They go and see a psychic in New York who supposedly can predict the date of your death. They, like, hear about the psychic. Daniel hears about the psychic from someone at school, and he's like, we should go. So they do, and they see her individually, and they each get told their death day. And they each have, like individually an experience with this woman who tells them what you know when they're gonna die and then they kind of don't talk about it again until their dad dies a few years later when they're teenagers and then they get kind of drunk like after his wake and they talk about you know their death day and we find out that Varya's death day is 121 2044 so it was like way in the future Daniel's is 11 24 2006 so he's like 54 I think or 55 um Clara just says 31 and Simon just says young and that's all he'll say young so then that's sort of like the intro chapter and then the book is broken into four different sections and each section is about each of the siblings so we hear about their life and they sort of like each section leads up to their date and you don't know like if they're gonna die or what's gonna happen on that day but it's sort of like their life leading up to that day and how they decide to live and whether they let that prediction impact their choices. Right? Yeah, and I I liked the last two lines on the book cover synopsis too. Read them. Both a dazzling family love story and a sweeping novel of remarkable ambition and depth, the immortalist probes the line between destiny and choice, reality and illusion, this world and the next. It is a deeply moving restatement to the power of story, the nature of belief, and the unrelenting pull of familial bonds. Ooh. Yeah, that's lovely. That's pretty lofty, which I think this book is rather lofty. Yeah. But it's also, I think, like a very in-depth character study of each of these people um, and and what they're like and why they make the choices they make and sort of what's, like, wrong with their heads. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Did I leave anything out that is important? No. You listened on audiobook, right? I did. Do you want to do the impression? I don't think the people want to hear the that The people impression. demand it. <laughs> Laura. Of, oh, of their wonderful mother. Yeah. Um, calling Simon. Simon. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm sorry to the listener's ears, I'm but that's so what sorry. you heard on the audiobook anytime um the mom was calling Simon. Yeah. Simon. And you kind of see why he wanted to run away. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to ask that about audiobooks. Like, was there anything distracting or, like, unusual or interesting that... I think we've found that there's definitely, um, like, we can perceive certain characters differently yeah. by the way that the narrator does their voice. Yeah, for sure. You know, whether it makes them like this, makes them sort of annoying and the opposite of endearing, and then versus uh, Howl's Moving Castle, where we had that one character where they made her sort of witchy sounding, but no one else who didn't listen um, thought of her that way. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. So. Yeah, it can really impact how you interpret the characters. Like you wonder how they make those decisions. The yeah. narrator, you know, is it, is it personal choice? Are they getting direction? Right. Do I people think direct audiobooks? I think so, yeah. Mm. Well, they produce them at least. Or produce um, yeah, I think so. Hmm. Well, I also wonder, I don't know, in the case of Diana Wynne Jones, probably not because I think she died a while ago, but I wonder if the authors get input right. in like how characters are interpreted. Right. I would imagine so. That's a really good question. If anyone mm. knows the answer, please tell us. You should get into that space. I should get into it? Mm-hmm. Inter- oh, reading audio audiobooks? Book. Ooh. No, audiobook production. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. a good idea. Mm-hmm. My dad is working on getting his book turned into an audiobook. Hi, dad. Oh. right now he's gonna he's gonna read it himself i would listen to an audiobook with your narration with mine yeah oh, thank you yeah. that's nice oh that's really nice to say i think it would i think it's probably really time consuming like think about how long it would I'm take sure. to like read a book out loud and like do it well <laughs> and right. do all the characters. it's definitely voices. not one take <laughs> yeah i'm always so impressed at the way they're able to do i mean so many characters yeah. not only all the main characters but all the side characters and they all sound completely different and yet they always sound the same. Like, I would never be able to fully remember what accent I was doing right. for each person. Right. And they do. To just seamlessly slip in and out mm-hmm. of it. I know. I've been listening to the Harry Potter books on audiobook, like one through seven. I've never listened to them before. And I'm on book seven now. And the guy who reads them, Jim Dale is his name. Good old Jim Dale. And he is amazing. And he, he does, does all of the voices. All of the char- Think of how many characters yeah. there are in Harry Potter. Like, so many. And they're all different seven. voices. And they're all different. And sometimes he sings, which I love. Like, he sings when he's, like, the sorting hat. And he sings when he's, I don't know. It's, like, very cute. I bet he has fun with that. It's amazing. Or had fun. I hope he got paid a lot of money. Certainly. Probably a sliding scale. Probably but not as much like, as the first one. But these, like, live forever, you know? I know, but, like, you never know. Like, when the first one came out, I don't think they knew what it was oh that's be, true you know yeah but i don't think they were i think they were recorded in like 20 oh, way after yeah like oh that's true because audiobooks were not a thing yeah but also audiobooks are expensive like 15 bucks a pop on mm-hmm. audible it's a lot well and the one for world war z won a bunch of awards so obviously there's some <gasps> that sort one of was so good so good that one was really good you know what you need to listen to have you listened to daisy jones and the six uh-uh. okay that was my, one of my favorite books from last year. I listened to it on audiobook. It is highly produced. It has like famous actors in it. It's awesome. Right. It's really good. Yeah. Hot tip. Hot anyway. tip. Anyways. Um, recommendation corner over. Yeah. <laughs> Just <my> recommendation <laughs> corner. Um, did you like the book, Laura? Yes or I no? I really liked the book. Did you like the book? Okay. I don't know how to answer this because I did not like the book, but then... After book club, I liked it. So originally you didn't like it. Yeah. Why? I just didn't look forward to reading it. I was, I, it was kind of like, just, I felt, and that's kind of how I base it. Like, am I looking forward to opening it? Am I like looking forward to sitting down? Can I binge it? Like, and this right. book took me a couple weeks to finish. It just, I was not excited about reading it. Why? I thought it was fine. I don't know. I think it was a combination of the structure, which I found to be kind of frustrating because you just only get one view, like you're only in one character for so long. And I wanted to know what the other siblings were doing. And so I felt like kind of like I had blinders on while I was reading it. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also just, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not a philosopher. I've never enjoyed philosophy. And so like the big questions kind of make me feel nauseous. Okay. So it was uncomfortable. Yeah, a little. Yeah. Mm. 
But then I really liked our discussion and I was kind of nervous actually going into book club because I felt so meh about this book. I was like, I really hope like we have stuff to talk about. Was genuinely, I said that like to Jake before I left. I was like, I don't know about this one. I'm kind of worried about this book. And then it turned out to be like one of our best discussions. So you didn't, so it didn't leave you with a bunch of thoughts and questions? I mean, it left me with a big one, which is like, would I want to know when I was going to die? Uh But the answer for that for me is like very clear and hard cut and like was not impacted by reading this book. I just am not, I don't like philosophizing. Is that a word? Yeah, I think so. It is now. Change approved. Well, so is it more that like all the questions that this probes into, you just like don't open that door. You just don't yeah, go kinda. there. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So I think this is the type of book that maybe if I read it as my coworker did, like not for a book club, I would it would be frustrating. Yeah. But because I was reading it to have a discussion, then I thought it was great because I had so many questions yeah. and things I wanted to discuss. Yeah. Like this is a really good book club. Book. I think you have to discuss this book to read it. And then just like put it down, you know, check it off on Goodreads and then go to the next one. Yeah. It would be different. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I told, yeah. So highly recommend this book for other book clubs, I guess, is the. Or at least, yeah, to read it with someone else or Or give it to someone after you read it. So you can talk about it. Yeah. Yeah, There were a couple people that said they did that. They're like, I gave this book to someone because I was like, you need to read it and talk to me about it. So that's cool. I mean, that makes that, I don't know. It doesn't change my, so I don't know how to answer. I guess I liked it now, but Mm -hmm. only because we talked about it. I don't know if that's fair. I'm changing my answer. (laughs) It's not allowed. I make the rules and I say, is it, does it have to be a hard yes or no? Yes. That's the purpose of the yes or no card. So then where do you land? You still land at a no? No, I think I've changed to a yes. I think I changed to a yes. Because also for me, like part of the question, do you like the book simultaneously is, would you recommend it? Um, And I would recommend this book, especially given like watching people's reactions to it. How many did I write down who liked it and who didn't like it? Yeah. We had seven yeses and only four no's. So most people liked it. Well, and I think because you were one of the no's, right? Yeah. And I think so was uh, Chelsea. And then by the end, she had gone the same way you did and saying that like, okay, I don't think I'm a no anymore Yeah, because I think there are parts of it that make you uncomfortable and then you talk it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's funny too, because I also feel like Chelsea is very practical and like doesn't enjoy, like, I don't really, honestly, I don't even like really thinking about space. Like Mm -hmm. thinking about space makes me feel like my brain's too small, Mm -hmm. you know? And I kind of feel that way about like the afterlife and religion too. Like it just makes me feel like, wow, I'm ill-equipped and I don't know. Well, and I think for her, I know in labor and delivery, she has to deal with death. Yeah. And so that's just probably part of the reason, too, yeah. is like you don't want to think about all of that. Yeah. Right. Oh, man. I went to the um, Museum of Death. Is that what it's called? I've so. heard that that is like very heavy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I know you'd think it would be, but like not, it's not like a true crime show or whatever. It made me feel so weird. I like had to leave because I was like really nauseous and sweaty. I know someone else who left and was like, that wasn't like watching an episode of Dateline. No. Like it It was super weird. Yeah. And I like, I was into it because I was like, okay, like I agree. Like their whole premise is like, let's um, open the curtain on death. Like our culture doesn't talk about death enough. Like it's like, you know, death, death, sex and taxes. Like those are like the things that are going to happen in your life. And we don't talk about death, which I totally agree with. I feel extremely ill-equipped to handle Compared death. to all other cultures. Yeah. So I was like, okay, like I support this idea. Like we should talk about death more. Like it's a part of life and like we should, we should try not to be afraid of it and all that stuff. Like that sounded good to me. But then I went to it and I was like, oh God. Never Too mind. It's a lot. It's a lot at once. <gasps> yeah, it's a lot. And then you can like, there's a gift shop on the way out. I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what are the major themes of this book? Destiny. Ooh, yeah. For sure. Faith. Faith. Family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Choices. Mm Mm-hmm. Or I guess the lack thereof. Um, fear. Yeah, definitely fear. Aging. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, those are all ones. Uh, all right. 
<clears throat> Let us get to our very first sentence. I love first sentences. This one. Varia is 13. The end. Is that the shortest first sentence? Short and sweet. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Only three words. It goes on to say, this is PG-13. New to her are three more inches of height and the dark patch of fur between her legs. Her breasts are palm-sized, her nipples pink dimes. I read that and I was like, "Woo! we yeah. are going. I know. I was like, this book, okay. Because mm-hmm. also I think it was like 7 a.m. on my way to work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean the the whole first section of the book is like PG thirteen oh, or R. R. Yeah, yeah. Simon's section is definitely R, yeah. R rated or X rated. I don't know yeah. how the ratings work, but well, it gets a little or NC seventeen. NC seventeen. Is that the other one? <laughs> yes. You would definitely yeah yeah have to go behind the curtain in the video shop. But then once that is after that section then it turns into sort of a different book it does yeah you know each someone said this at book club and i agreed with it it almost felt like each section was its own short story Mm -hmm. because they are very different i think that's how i looked at it and why i didn't mind the way it was chunked is that i saw each one as like an in-depth short story or pictured it like um a movie short and we got to see sort of more fully what happened to someone because I can struggle with a book or a movie that flits around and then you have to remember, you have to pick back up yeah. like what was going on versus giving you a big chunk at once mm-hmm. and fleshing it out. So yeah. I liked the structure. That's really interesting. So if they make this into something, I feel like it would be a great like four-part series mm. or five maybe. Like one of those HBO yeah. series, mm-hmm. something like that. And each episode is like each character's section. That'd be yeah. cool. I'd watch that. I think there were many parts throughout this book where I was like, I could definitely see this being a great... I mean, you know, when Simon gets a job go-go dancing and he's painted purple. I was like, I could see that like being in that club yes. would look so cool yeah. on screen. All yes. these purple dancers and then Clara doing her magic trick, like spinning around on that rope. That would look so cool. Like, there's so visual. many moments. Yeah. yeah. That seemed very visually interesting. That's so true. And the lab, or his mm-hmm. lab. And then the part in the trailer, that whole standoff, like a lot of it just seemed very well set up. Like it was very vividly described and I just feel like it would make a good, you know, mini series. I wonder, or yeah, I didn't look up to see if this rights have been purchased yet. Um, Reese Witherspoon, get on it. Reese, where you at? <laughs> um, okay. So we said this in the plot recap, but it's Daniel's idea to go meet with this psychic he's the second oldest he's the second oldest he like hears about it from boys at school and he comes home and he tells it's summer they have nothing to do it's like 1969 kids can just like roam the streets in (laughs) nice kids can just roam the streets in packs and like do whatever they want um so he comes home and he's like hey brothers and sisters i got this great idea let's go do it so they like go ride their bikes and this supposedly where this woman lives and they get in and they go and see her So my question is, like, is everything that follows Daniel's fault? Just a side note, as you were describing that, this is definitely one of those things, kind of like every episode of Friends, that if this took place in, like, any other more current decade, like, it's not really plausible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. These kids being... um, Like, an eight-year-old can't just, like, go meet with a psychic today. Yeah. People would call the cops if they saw, (laughs) like, kids by themselves. So true. Yeah. Anyway. I believe it is his fault. Wow. Because, oh, like, younger siblings are, like, they want to do what their older siblings are doing, and you they can be easily manipulated by the older siblings. Whether or not you are intentionally manipulating them, they'll do whatever you say, most younger siblings, speaking from experience. Like, my sister would do whatever, and you can use that, like, for good or evil. I don't know. They yeah. don't have, they're not, like, thinking for themselves. I used to make Tucker eat cat food. God, I thought you were going to say cat poop. So that's better. I wasn't that still mean. not great. The cat food that was like shaped like little chickens. Did you I ever told dress him, him up? Chickens. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the game Pretty Pretty Princess? Yes. Oh. Was he a pretty pretty oh, princess? Oh, yeah. We made him play that with us all the time. Oh, I want to see a picture of that. You know, I tried <laughs> to buy that game because I wanted to play it now. 
even though I don't think the tiara or anything would fit on me. And it's going for like hundreds of dollars on <gasps> no. eBay because they don't, I don't think they make it anymore. Oh my God, like, I wish I still had mine. I know. I'm sure I, mine's destroyed. Like a gold mine. We had that. And then we had one where you were collecting like fake nail tips and you had to end <sighs> with a full set. <laughs> Those would definitely not fit. Kind of like how bugles don't fit on my fingers. <laughs> That's how you knew you were really an adult was when bugles no longer fit on your fingertips. Oh, sad. That was a sad day. That's a sad day. Only the pinky. You know? <laughs> you can only do the one witch nail. So, so, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, yeah. I, I believe it's his fault. I don't think it is. In part because they were all children. Yeah. And also because I think that is a slippery slope of like, okay, well, if he's responsible because of that choice, then he's responsible. Then you're basically saying he's responsible for every choice all of them make the rest of their lives. Which is not true. If you believe in free will, it's right. not true. I know. I get. Yeah, I don't think that everything the rest of their lives is his fault, but... Yeah, I don't know. It's a hard one. Yeah. Now that I'm thinking This through, book is full just, of hard ones, Laura. I know. <laughs> hey, <I hate> yo. <laughs> Philosophize. Philosophizers. Um, okay, so, well, the ultimate question from this book is, would you want to know? Okay, wait. Hold on. Let me set it up. Let me set it up. Rewind, rewind. Laura, in the next room is a psychic. Okay. Mm-hmm. I heard about her. Through some friends. From my mom. I heard about her from your mom. <laughs> and she's legit. She has a couple Google ratings. She's in the next room. I already paid her. Or no, she didn't take any money. She doesn't want any money. Um, I gave her a Dr. Zevia. <laughs> so she's having Dr. Zevia in the next room and she's she will tell you when you die. Do you go in there? Absolutely not. Yeah. No. I, no, me either. No. No way. Because as I found out from my mom this morning, any real psychic will not give you bad news news of death let alone date of a death your death anyone's death but bad news in general that is like a a rule of the psychics and medium world is that you don't give bad news because as we see in this book like it's not it's not actually going to help anyone and that woman can say all she wants she was trying to help but you know there's no way it's going to make someone's life better by telling them this. Yeah. Do you think there's a psychic code like HIPAA? It seems like there is from what my mom told me because she said my aunt went around for the past year to all different psychics trying to find out when my uncle was going to pass because he's been sick. He's been in in and out of the hospital and then in hospice. And she's like, I just want to know so I can be prepared. You know, it'll help me. It'll comfort me. And none of them would tell her when he was going to die or if it was going to be this year or soon. They would say things like, I see you moving by yourself. And she would press them, you know, is it because he dies or am I getting a divorce? And they won't say. Hmm. Do you, so do you think it's like a do no harm kind of thing? Yeah. Like well, and I think for them, that's almost like um, dark. It's not magic, not dark magic, but like Ooh. that's the dark world of yeah. spirits. Oh, that's a good point. You know, and yeah. you want to stay in the light. Stay in the light. So you only want to tell people stuff that like, well, I don't know. So what else would be an example of that? What of... Of dark, like, dark Um, premonitions. I know my mom was, uh, she was going to have a major surgery. This was, like, 10 years ago, and she was seeing a psychic who said, you know, you shouldn't have, the closest she ever got to, like, bad news, dark news was, like, you should not have your surgery in this month. You need to have it in the next month. Like, made it very clear. My mom rescheduled the (gasps) the surgery. She did? Because how can you hear something like that and not, you know? Or they'll, I think my uncle had something said to him, like, you know, go call your boyfriend, make sure you, something like that. And he ended up dying. <gasps> like, I, I forget. I wish I could remember now. I should have asked her um, to refresh me on that. But it was something where they'll say, like, make sure you do this. <gasps> or make sure you talk to your mom about the will. So <gasps> they won't tell you, like, your mom's going to die. But they'll, you know, so right. they'll only tell you. Neutral things or positive things. Interesting. 
Or they'll tell you like positive things about the bad thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I guess that's just like good advice probably. Like, hey, talk to your mom about her will. (laughs) Like, you know, okay, yeah, good. Hey, Mm. thanks. Like, good advice. Yeah. But. Or if they see something bad happening, like, they'll try to warn you. But not in like a spooky, spooky, scary way. Yeah. So do you believe in psychics? I don't know, you know, and I don't think I'll know until, you know, my mom and I have a code and she said when I pass and it's a numerical code so that there's no, you know, oh, I think that light bulb flickered or anything that can be misconstrued. It's, you know, a a four digit numerical (gasps) code. And so then I'll know. But until then. you see the code places. Or well, if I or if I go visit a psychic or a medium, <gasps> and you they know, and tell she, you the code, yeah, <gasps> because my mom claims that she's seen this happen, or been told by friends who go see someone, and they're like, oh, "I'm seeing the number, you know, eighty-seven. Like, what does that mean to you?" And there's no reason for this person to say that, and then they're like, "Oh my god, that was their <gasps> jersey or something." So, whoa, you know, we try to use something specific. Because my dad and I are both in the STEM field, so we're very um, yeah, like science logical. People. Yeah, and so it's hard for. And then she's so far the other way, ah! believing in all of this. I love it. And so she wants to get us on board. And it's like that's her last ditch effort. You know, you'll see. <laughs> that's so you'll cool. See later. I'm like I'm very into that. Although I do think like I'm just not that curious. I think it's scary. Yeah, to think about it is. So it's just easier to not. My aunt was also, the same one, was also going to a pet psychic. Whoa. What does that mean? So then it's like, do you believe in that? Wait, so they were communicating with her dead pets? No, so her dog's still alive, but she's very, very sick and like can barely move. And she needs to be put down, but my aunt feels so bad. So she was visiting a pet psychic who was apparently communicating Bella, that's the dog, Bella's thoughts. Stop it. (laughs) I know, like, it shouldn't be laughing because this is a sick dog, but it's like, to me, that's pushing it a little far. But apparently this pet psychic was like, Bella wants you to know that she's okay with all of it. She had a great life. And whether or not you believe in it, I feel like it's giving her comfort. Right. And so even if it pet psychic is fake, if that's the service they're doing, I think I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. You know? If it brings her, like, yeah, comfort and peace. Yeah, that's... How expensive is that? I don't know. <laughs> we should we should we all get into? But this? like the mo- one of the most unbelievable parts of this book is the fact that she doesn't take money from anyone. It's like then is she a real psychic? I don't know. You think only? A, <laughs> oh, she's she's not a professional psychic. She's not. Yeah. Then what money. is? How does she have any money? How does she afford that trailer she lives in? Right. Well, she's pretty old, so maybe she gets like social security. Oh. I mean, I don't know. Social security from. Yeah. Yeah, but did she ever work? She's from a family of gypsies. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Um, Yeah, I wouldn't want to know my death day. I see the argument for it if it's like tomorrow or whatever, but... Mm, No, even then, it would still ruin your last day. I mean, it's like Erica said, You, the goal is to just to live as if always yeah you could yolo it up yeah because if you know it's next week you might want to think like oh then i'll finally make sure i do the things i want to do or say the things i want to say but really you'd probably just be so distraught right yeah yeah it would ruin i agree it would ruin your like final time um okay we kind of talked about the structure of this book already um and I can see both arguments for it. People said they didn't like it, and other people said they did like it. I was kind of torn. I felt it to be a little bit restrictive. I almost wished, like, we could flip back and forth a little in the beginning. And then, like, the sections get longer and longer or something like that. Oh, yeah, and they slowly, like, uh, the know. opposite of converge. It just felt so abrupt to me to go from, like, an omnipresent narrator introducing all of these concepts to then only getting Simon's portion, who's the youngest. I guess you're right, because I got so engrossed in Simon, and I was it was really vividly described. I was, like, there with him, and then I kind of forgot about the other ones yeah. until they were brought up, and I was like, oh, yeah, there's another one. Because yeah. that story was so engrossing to me, like, his well, section. And he runs away with Clara, but we don't even really, like, 
get that much info about what she's doing for a while even though they like yeah are she's living there together. yeah so it's very like what's the word for it like one dimensional mm, that's not right just perspective we're only getting one perspective mm-hmm. at a time for like a long time it's kind of frustrating. Especially, well, I felt it especially in Clara's section, which was section two, because she was, like, so kooky and, like, um, like had all these really weird, bizarre ideas about um, her life and the afterlife and stuff. And I just kept being like, what is going on with the other family members? Like, wh- do they believe this? Like, what are they doing? Like, how are their lives unfolding? And you just don't get it. Um, but do you think some of that was also paralleling how they, a lot of them like didn't speak to each other? Yeah, for you know, sure. They had strained relationships. They were really isolated from each other. Yeah. And so I think that reinforced that, yeah. that their lives were separate. Yeah. It's hard to read that though. We, I think we talked about this at book club too. Like it's hard to read about characters who are estranged from each other because you're like, just make up. Like, I know it's like really hard. You want to like help them reconcile and you feel frustrated by it. Like this book was frustrating. Speaking as two people who are close with their siblings, yeah, it's just wild to think about not being that way, yeah. about having your brother call you and you hang up on him or he hangs up on you or whatever it was that happened and then you just don't speak. Yeah. Or, you know, you have a niece or nephew for you and you just don't see them really mm-hmm. and they call you a stranger later. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But I know there's a lot of people out there that that is their re- reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing. Well, I think one of the sad parts about it is, like, especially with Simon, like, you think, like, when you have a fight with someone, um, especially when you're young, you have a fight with them, and you're like, well, I'm going to leave this alone for now. It's too hard to deal with. Like, this is too emotional. Like, it's too heated, whatever. You know, we'll, we'll catch up later. They'll come around. Like, we'll talk later. But then they die. And you never get the opportunity to, like, reconcile or, like, fix it. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, which is kind of what happened with Daniel and Simon. And then Daniel lived the rest of his life with this, like, heavy guilt Mm -hmm. of, like, not making more of an effort and not reconciling with his brother. Even though, like, that feels really normal. Like, they were both, like, in their early 20s, like... They were living across the country from each other. Like, Simon had made this huge... Without cell phones or the internet. (laughs) Well, yeah, definitely. But Simon had made this big life choice that he didn't agree with. Like, but you think, oh, well, he'll come back around. I'll Mm -hmm. see him next year at Christmas Mm -hmm. or whatever. But then they didn't. Mm -hmm. And that's so sad. Yeah, that's what, I mean, like Kobe Bryant's death. A lot of people are saying, you know, now is the time. Don't put it off. Call that person you've been meaning to call. Don't hold a grudge. Say what you want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's sad. I mean, I guess that is a good lesson to take from death. Well, that was something we talked about this book, too, of, like, what is the meaning of the title? And, like, what can you learn from death? And perhaps, like, one thing you can learn is like how to keep their memory alive um so that they are in sort of like immortal they you never die because those who you've touched and impacted like live on and remember you so what do you think the title means well i think or what do you like how what do you think it's referring to i mean i think it's well i think it's referring to clara's like belief in the afterlife, which is that, like, you don't really die. You, like, just kind of change energies and, like, can still communicate with your loved ones because she believes that Simon and Saul, the dad, are communicating with her. Right. Um, But I don't really think that's the point of view of the whole book. I think that was just that one character's mm-hmm. belief. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I guess the idea of the immortalist is just, like, is death a finality or not? I would argue not. It's more comforting to think not. Yeah. And I know that's why my mom is like not scared of death because she believes mm, yeah. in the afterlife. See? Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely comforting. Mm-hmm. But I don't even mean from like an act. I don't know if I believe in an afterlife. Again, these are questions I don't really like thinking about. But. Because you can't even prove with- it. 
Right. Yeah. Right. Because nobody really knows who's right. So until we know that, like, I'm just not that interested in postulizing. Mm -hmm. That's a word. Postulating. Postulating. Something. I've been, I've been ising a lot of words (laughs) in this podcast. Uh, Forgive me. No, I think, yeah, I think that people are immortal if they're remembered by the living. You're saying leave a legacy. Yeah, I guess so. Do you think, like, Simon lived on through his boyfriend? Yes, through Robert, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, he left an impact on him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and he impacted Clara so much that, well, spoiler alert. I don't know if I should say it. He impacted Clara a lot, too, and changed the course of her life Um, through his own death. Yeah. I don't know. But then, of course, I wish we haven't really talked about Varia. Varia. Why do I have so much trouble with her name? Varia. Varia. Like from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. She um, believes, I think, like in the idea of immortality being that you, like, you can stave off death by making healthy life choices. Mm -hmm. So she dedicates her life to, like, excuse you, Floor. (laughs) She dedicates her life to, yeah, like, studying aging and how to slow it down well and also develops severe ocd yeah and it's that common thing with people with ocd that if they don't do their ritual someone they love will get hurt or die right that they'll cause something bad to happen by not doing the thing Mm -hmm. yeah it's that which is really interesting yeah it's so interesting how you can think i know for a lot of people it's like oh i have to flick the light three times or touch the door handle four times yeah and how your brain equates that to like your mom getting hit by a car Mm -hmm. it's wild i know well yeah it's like a combination of superstition Mm -hmm. which is in this book a lot like their mom gertie is extremely superstitious Mm -hmm. so they all sort of grow grow up like watching her you know not walk past um what is it when she was pregnant she wouldn't walk past any graveyards and oh, that was one thing, that. remember? Yeah, they had to, like, go blocks out of their way because she wouldn't walk by a graveyard. Like, she's really superstitious. Why? What's going to happen? A spirit's going to go... Get into your steal, womb. Get in your baby. You don't deliver a <laughs> I don't know. demon baby. I don't know. I don't think I'm very superstitious, but... Are you a little stitious? I think I'm a little stitious. <laughs> like, I definitely have dreams that, like, are very vivid and might impact, like, my behavior in a day or, like, the things that I'm worried about. And that's probably Do you open an umbrella inside? I try not to. Oh, I do. <gasps> you do? I do, and I feel like I do it you live more out edge. of like a, like, screw this. I don't believe in, you I'm can't prove control this isn't me. True. Yeah, from like the science perspective. Yeah. Or like. I the, love that. What was it? Cracked mirror. Yeah. What are the Breaking a mirror. Ones? You have bad luck for seven years. Walking mm-hmm. under a ladder. Seeing a black cat. Or like a black, black cat, cat crossing your path. And like my brother has a black dog and. Black cats and dogs have such a lower adoption rate right. because of that. And yeah. It's very sad. I always had black cats as a child. Mm. So I don't believe in that one either. But I definitely like try not to walk under ladders. Although, honestly, well, I don't know. It's, it's hard just to a say. good safety tip. Yeah, right. It just seems safer. But the umbrella one, it's like ridiculous. That one is stupid. I feel like I do. Okay, when I get on an airplane, I say goodbye to the ground. What? Yeah. Is that a super For good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I did it once and then the plane made it safely. So I was like, well, got to do this every time now. Oh, you know, there's so much superstition in sports. Oh yeah, for sure. And I'm not a sports person. So perhaps I would, if I, I feel you have, have to wear the same socks you were wearing last time they won. It's funny how many, like for say for the Super Bowl coming up, like how many people are going to be wearing a certain thing or wearing something inside out or sitting in a certain chair. Yeah. Like they have to all collectively. Wouldn't it be crazy if like we saw God and he had a checklist of like, okay, like Joe Smith is wearing that Jersey inside <laughs> out. Okay. Okay. And he had, like, if everyone's doing all the thing they have to do, you know, Sheldon's sitting in that spot on the couch, then he's like, all right, I'll help them make this catch. Yes. Make this kick. And, like, well, that'd be a funny, if only. like SNL, clip or something where you make it actually be true because it seems ridiculous it's ridiculous well i think it's rooted and i think this too about because i i do have a slight fear of flying i have real anxiety about flying and 
I, I talk to myself all the time in my own head about how selfish these fears are. And I think it, because it's rooted in the idea that you have the power to change outcomes outside of your own control. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That like, it's a selfish idea because you think what you do matters basically. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't. Yeah. Like what makes you the all powerful one? Right. Like whether or not I worry about the plane crashing has no impact on whether or not the plane crashes. Well, but that's what I was saying is what if it's a collective thing Mm. and it's not just you, but it's everyone and everyone has to do their ritual. Right. To make it happen. Collectively. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I kind of hate that because I I don't trust anyone. You can't can't trust people. You can't trust anyone. That's the real theme of the book (laughs) and of life. (laughs) Trust no one. I feel like you said this on the last podcast. <laughs> no, the, the exactly. last one I was on, the theme was octopuses. Oh, right. not be trusted. Yeah. Luckily, there weren't any octopi in this. Oh, God. Well, spoiler alert, there's no octopi in here. If you're looking for octopi <laughs> content, God. go elsewhere. Thank God. Um, Man, we're already at like 40 minutes, so I don't really know what else we should okay, get so into. Okay, so Varia. Yes. So I know we some people were saying, so she found out she was going to live to be 80. 88. But yet she lived the most um, careful life. Mm-hmm. And some people were saying, if you found out you were going to live super long, why, why wouldn't you do the opposite? Right. You could just be really risk, risky. So then I told my mom this, and her hot take was, well, don't you think it was – the self-fulfilling prophecy that because she was so careful and calculated, that's why she made it to 88. Yes. And right. I was like, oh. Yeah. Definitely. I didn't think about it like that. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, these are all kind of self-fulfilling prophecies. I just didn't think about hers as one until yeah. she pointed that out. That right. I thought she was just sort of wasting it all. Yeah. Being scared. But then it's like her being scared maybe is what, because she almost became like a bubble person. Yeah. In a certain sense. I mean, I did think... Yeah, that's a question that we have is like... it, the, Like, the argument is made that like Varia's living a lesser life in order to live longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if I buy that argument, which I'm only just thinking about now. Okay, here's what I mean. Yes, she had a, she had some OCD. She had some psychological issues that she needed to address. That is true. And perhaps had she done that, like she wouldn't have lived her life that way. But when it comes to like what she did for work and like her calorie restriction thing, because she was like you know eating her little bags of food, um, she was basically eating the same food that monkeys were eating. Like I just don't like the idea of like the idea of like living a lesser life. Like you should live life however you want to what who's to say that her life right, was... is less mm-hmm. if that's how if that's how she's happy because she was conducting research right if her life's if, her, if she is fulfilled by doing this job and i guess i guess the question is like was she was well she, she actually fulfilled? but she kind of admits Maybe that she not. wasn't right at the end because she was like i should have signed up for j date yeah <laughs> right but i feel like people pass judgment on other people's lives like well you're living a lesser life because of xyz reason and that's not always i mean that's just not for you to say well yeah because some people could think oh if you live in a small town you live a boring life but there's plenty of people that that's the dream for them yeah and they're super happy and they are feel fulfilled Mm -hmm. um yeah and then you hear that all the time about like and even with the j-date thing it's like well she felt like she should find a partner because that's sort of what is expected of people but did she really want a partner or did mm-hmm. she just feel like she should want a partner? Mm-hmm. Kind of a question. So, yeah. I don't know if I buy that. But also I can definitely see, like, how a fear of death can paralyze you. Yeah, I think for her there was probably something in between where if she, like you said, got some help for some of her issues, she could have lived a slightly more fulfilling life. With less regret. Right. Maybe not a wild and crazy Simon type life, but something with a little more going for it. Because, you know, when the incident happened at her work and then that was all she had and then, you know, ruined her. She was totally lost. Yeah. That she, you know, at least a more well-balanced life. Yeah. 
Well, I also I I also don't like the lesson which I think is taught especially on the internet and memes and stuff. It's like live a life with no regrets. Like that is I just that's just like not I don't think that's great advice. Like this impo- first of all, I think it's impossible. Like you can't always make the right choice. Mm-hmm. You can't always. And if you try to put that pressure on yourself, then you'll probably be paralyzed and not make any choices. Well, and you could almost take it as like, don't apologize. Yeah. If someone, if you did something that was shitty or made someone feel bad, you're like, well, no regrets. No regrets. I mean, hopefully you take it as it's a way to take something in the past that maybe wasn't so good or that you would change. And instead of saying, oh, I regret that and dwelling on the past, say, okay, what can I learn from that? How can I grow from that? Right. Yeah. Like. Yeah, like, re- looking back on something as a regret is a cho- an active choice you're making. Mm-hmm. Of, like, oh, I regret that because of the X, Y, Z reason. Uh, yeah, I just think, like, oh, live a life with no regrets. Like, it's that's not reasonable. Just depends on what you classify as a regret. Yeah. Because, you, I mean, you don't want to have regrets because then you're just dwelling on what you change about the past and sort of ruining your present Right, because you can't change the past. Mm-hmm. Or can you <laughs> on our next episode? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, and then I try to sell pet psychic services. <laughs> Call 1 800. <laughs> yeah. Miss Cleo. Miss Cleo. Is she still in jail? Remember her? <laughs> yeah, I remember her. I didn't know she was in jail. Oh, yeah. For fraud. <laughs> yeah. Shockingly, she was not a real psychic. That's a shock. Yeah, and I don't think her accent was real either. Really? I don't think her name was Miss Cleo. Oh my god! <laughs> what can you believe? Freaking her nothing. real name was Doctor Zevia. Freaking nothing. Okay, one complaint about this book that people had was that they didn't like any of the characters. Right. Did you agree with that? I didn't like any of them either. But as I said then, and I'll say it again now, I don't like a lot of people in life either. And I think (laughs) for me, that made it more realistic where, and also, you know, if someone got a description of everything I did as like a young 20 something, would they like me? I don't know. Would they think I did a lot of dumb stuff, made a lot of dumb decisions? Yeah. Probably. You know? And so it made the characters more real to me. Yeah. Yeah. They did feel very real. Because they were so flawed. Extremely flawed. And fighting with each other. Yeah. And that was part of also, like, what made this book frustrating. Was that, like, these characters were making all these choices that you wouldn't make yourself. And so you're like, oh, why are you doing that? Stop. Like, don't do it. Stop. Stop it. Stop doing that. But that's, like, that's their thing. Like, that's what they're doing. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just kept thinking, like, I know I've done stuff that if I was watching it back or reading it back, I would be screaming at myself not to do yeah, it. Yeah, don't do that. That's and obviously so, stupid. Don't do it. But, yeah. like, then they do it anyways because they're humans and they're flawed and they, you know, you can't see outside your own nose. I don't like when characters in a book are too romanticized. Yes. And they act in a way that you wouldn't act and they're not flawed enough or they're flawed only in like a sexy way only in the cutest ways yeah or in like a you know damaged brooding way i'm so clumsy that's my thing i'm just super clumsy Isn't yeah that cute? adorkable yeah uh, other than that i'm perfect mm-hmm. um okay. if i you know i would have painted myself purple and danced oh yeah yeah mm-hmm. at perp oh god you want to go to perp? I want to go to perp so bad. <laughs> <laughs> I would also go to perp. It sounds pretty fun. Someone should open that in Boys Town. Right? I Do you think that was a real place in the Castro? No. I'm sure it was um, just, like, Honestly, by... when I was reading about, like, what they went through to get ready every night, it seemed very economically unfeasible. Like, the <laughs> amount of purple It's like the blue man on. group. Yeah. I feel like it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Sure. Bad for the pores. Very bad for the pores. Certainly. Well, Laura, it's been such a pleasure. Any final, any final and closing thoughts? Um, if you have siblings, you know, call your siblings. Aww. Don't hold grudges That's against them true. because you never know. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, you never know. And don't find out your death day, idiots. 
It's not a good idea. No. Don't do it. And, well, and everybody loves magic, right? We didn't really talk about that. But, like, when the fact that Ruby was doing that magic show Mm, for the seniors, Mm -hmm. that was wholesome. That was really wholesome. I liked that. Yeah. Yeah. Magic is pretty cool. I feel like magic is, like, making a comeback. Definitely. Of late. I want to learn a card trick. I want to be able to do a card trick. Yeah. I think that's on my I believe in you. bucket list for this year. I think you can do it. One day I'm just gonna whip it out. Good yeah, it's good. Literally. Party trick. <laughs> gonna ask you to pick a card. Okay. And you'll see. Okay. Yeah. Can't wait. All right, well thanks for listening. Um our book for February is called Red, White, and Royal Blue Ooh. by Casey McQuiston. It is an international love story. And it should be a really fun one. I am actually personally unreasonably excited for it. I am really, I can't wait to read it. Why? I don't know. I just think it's going to be so cute. I don't know. I don't, I don't usually read romance. So I don't know. I'm excited. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be good. I'm excited too. Yeah. Thanks for listening to our discussion of The Immortalists. You can follow Books with Brooks on Instagram or Twitter. I almost said Tinder. You cannot find us there. <laughs> you can find me on Tinder. You can find Laura on Tinder. All you singles, shout out. Hello. All right. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Books with Brooks is in the Press Play Podcast Network, and our theme music is by Jonathan Allen. Bye.